Bom, gente, começando então, eu sou Ronaldo Lemos, eu sou um dos diretores do Instituto de Tecnologia e Sociedade do Rio de Janeiro, que vocês têm a, estão aqui tendo a oportunidade de conhecer. Para quem não conhece bem o ITS, o ITS é uma espécie de um think tank, é uma instituição que pensa todo o impacto da tecnologia sobre os mais diversos campos sociais. Então, o impacto da tecnologia para a educação, para a ciência, para a política, para os direitos, então a gente tem uma série de eventos que a gente faz periodicamente, esse é um deles, que se chamam Varandas ITS, a gente já teve varandas aqui discutindo cibersegurança, marco civil da internet, bitcoins, a relação de moda e tecnologia, já discutimos temas como a sociologia das redes, então esses são eventos que a gente sempre organiza, a ideia é sempre fazer fazer os eventos abertos, gratuitos e fugindo um pouco daquele formalismo da academia, que a gente tem que ficar sempre muito formal. Então a ideia é fazer algo sempre com comidas, bebidas, de preferência cervejas artesanais, que tem a ver com a ideia e o espírito do ITS. Então quem quiser acompanhar, sempre a gente anuncia esses eventos na nossa página no ITS do Facebook. Então a gente, esse é o nosso, vamos dizer, ponto de partida para esses eventos. Hoje a gente está aqui com o privilégio de ter uma das organizações mais importantes do mundo, eu diria, sobre a luta pelos direitos na chamada fronteira digital. Essa organização é a EFF, Electronic Frontier Foundation, que foi fundada em 1990, inclusive, é, dentre outras pessoas, por um grande amigo chamado John Perry Barlow, que é famoso, inclusive, por ter sido integrante da banda de rock Grateful Dead. É, e ele fundou a IFF junto com Mitch Kapoor, John Gilmore, em 1990, justamente porque naquela época eles já percebiam que o grande impacto que a internet teria para a sociedade e, mais do que isso, a preocupação de que os governos e ah, agências reguladoras do mundo inteiro fizessem coisas erradas com relação à internet, ou seja, regulassem errado, regulassem de forma equivocada. E a IFF teve esse papel pioneiro que cresceu ao longo dos anos seguintes e hoje defende direitos dos usuários na internet. Então, eu queria apresentar a cada um dos integrantes. Além disso, a gente tem a Fundação Panopticon, que eu acho que também merece destaque nessa é, batalha. É uma fundação mais nova, fundada em 2009. É mais jovem, uma criança, mas uma criança já bem fortinha, very strong already, é, dentro desse debate da luta pelos direitos. Estão fazendo uma apresentação formal aqui. A gente tem hoje o privilégio de receber a Catícia Rodrigues, que é diretora de Direitos Internacionais da IFF. Muito obrigado por estar aqui conosco, Katitza. A gente também tem o privilégio de ter a Catarzina Shemilevitz, tá bom? Oh, muito bom, que é cofundadora e presidente da Panopticon Foundation e é uma conselheira para a Icelandic Modern Media Initiative e também do ministro de administração e digitalização da Polônia. Muito obrigado por estar aqui conosco. Thank you so much for being with us. E a gente também tem o, o Hani Fakuri, que é advogado, that I got right, huh? uh, advogado da IFF, com um trabalho voltado para leis criminais e processos sobre privacidade e liberdade de expressão. Dentro da fundação, ele representou clientes em investigações civis e criminais e escreveu inúmeros pareceres em tribunais dos Estados Unidos com relação à questão de cibercrimes. Então, vai ser muito interessante te ouvir também, Hani. Uh, e por fim, é, last but not least, a gente tem aqui o privilégio de ter o Danilo Doneda, que é um dos, diria, é, patronos do ITS, espirituais e intelectuais, a gente respeita muito a produção e o trabalho do Danilo nessa área de privacidade, ele é um dos é, autores mais respeitados e conhecidos sobre o tema aqui no Brasil, e ele é doutor e mestre em Direito Civil pela UERJ e coordenador geral de estudos e monitoramento de mercado do Ministério da Justiça, tem feito uma atuação brilhante no Ministério da Justiça sobre a defesa do tema da privacidade, 
comunidade, eu sou testemunha desse trabalho, então é sempre um privilégio ter também você aqui com a gente, Danilo. Com isso eu vou passar a palavra para a Joana Varon, que é professora aqui do, do ITS, para você contar um pouquinho do projeto Antivigilância. E right after Joana, we will start with the debate. We will have like short presentations, and then the idea is that we open this for a, an open conversation with everyone. Então, Joana, por favor, obrigado. Olá a todos. É, o projeto Oficina Antivigilância é o projeto do ITS que trata mais a fundo dos temas de, de vigilância e de privacidade. A gente tem basicamente dois componentes, um deles são oficinas de, de treinamento de ferramentas de segurança digital, então ensinar como encriptar, é, que ferramentas usar pra, pra, dependendo das necessidades e por outro lado a gente estuda também a, as, as políticas na área de privacidade, na área de vigilância mas também as ferramentas. O, fazem parte do projeto Lucas Teixeira, que está aqui também, e o Aleixo. E sempre tentando misturar essa análise técnica, tecnológica, com a técnica jurídica e política, a gente produz um boletim. A, o próximo boletim deve sair esses dias para seguir, acho que o mais fácil é o Twitter, e aí vocês vão ter o link do boletim, é arroba antivigilância, e é basicamente isso, a gente vai estar por aqui também para dúvidas ou quem quiser se inscrever por aí. Vou passar a palavra para os palestrantes. Who starts? <risos> ok. Um... I'm very sorry, I cannot speak any other language than this one. Uh, I can understand some other, but I cannot speak well enough to say what I want to say to you. Are you okay with this or we need uh, some translation? Okay, that's great. Uh, so we thought that... <clears throat> I, I will be distracted, okay? It's like all the airplanes, all the amazing views. It's the first time we discuss things in a such setting, right? So please forgive us, we are not used to <laughs> speaking in, <laughs> in this landscape. Beautiful. <laughs> it's just too beautiful for us. Okay, back to the topic. So we, we thought that we will start with um, maybe short uh, insight from us, uh, from me than, than others on the, the basic question really for, for the privacy and surveillance uh, activism, which is why should we care at all, right? Why should we care about our data? Why should we be hiding, hiding from, from our government or from the companies? Uh, I say hiding in inverted commas because of course I don't perceive uh, being privacy protective as hiding and I will explain why. But this is the, the kind of uh, mm, concept that comes back at least in Europe all the time, in the media, in political debate, and I believe here as well people say I don't care I actually think that living in the digital age assumes sharing more and more and more people clearly share more so maybe they just don't want privacy and they don't want to be protected and we should stop this kind of activity that we all of us here are, are doing so I just wanted to give you my quick take on this and hopefully we can discuss more uh, but maybe before I start I let me give you, let, let, please give me a show of hands who of you thinks that I have nothing to hide? Who shares that approach, if anybody? Don't be ashamed. <laughs> like, we can disagree, come on. Nobody? <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> that makes things... Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, so, my dear, would you, sh would you also show us, for example, your search queries for last month? Would you share information like this with us? No. no. Ah, <laughs> see? So we got her already red-handed. She really has something to hide. Okay, so the way I see it is the first problem with this thinking is that people tend to believe that the that Internet knows about them only what they share actively, like they choose to share, right? We all go, on, uh, go online for certain purposes, like communicating, uh, posting, that I had the best view in the world in Rio, or uh, whatever. And some people believe that that's it. That's the information that others have on me, right? What we need to do in our work, and what I want to stress here, is that, of course, that's not really the case. So, but, but even, even if we just share what we consciously uh, reveal, 
that's already kind of problematic because if you, I chose the example of the search queries for a reason. How many of you feel that you remember your search queries for last month? Like you really know what you were searching for? Exactly, I don't. Like I, I, I even did this experiment myself. I don't keep the search queries now. I prefer Google not to have it. But some time ago, Google had my search queries and I looked at them. And it was very impressive for me to realize that's the story of my life that I don't remember myself. So if somebody is an active uh, participant of Facebooks, LinkedIn's, Foursquares, whatever is there on, on the market now, I'm pretty sure none of these people are able to control really what they share. So the problem starts here. We moved our lives online, we moved them to the extent that we are not able to control them exactly the way we are not able to control our gestures, our, the way we speak in, a, in a private conversations, right? I, I will not, if I control myself all the time, I'm fake. And in my life, I don't want to be fake. Same online. People forget, forget that all the traces they leave behind stay. They get recorded. They get into the databases of the big companies and beyond, of course, governments and whatever we can imagine. So that's the first problem that we have to remember. But second, maybe even bigger, is that we share more than we realize. And you know that, but not many people beyond maybe this veranda, not even in Rio, are aware that, of course, the, all the metadata that's even the bigger uh, power, information power for those who want to surveil us. Because what I write, what I type, what I, the pictures I share, it's just a little piece of information about me. The analytics of when I go online, what I do online, with whom I connect online, what times, what locations, what time zones, how often, all this tells actually much more about my, my routines, my behavior, and I'm completely not able to control that. The metadata we leave behind is completely beyond our comprehension. I'm, I'm absolutely sure that I wouldn't be able to guess the kind of metadata that I generate myself, even though I'm sort of thinking about that and trying to be conscious. So, so that's like the second uh, aspect of the, the, the revealing. But there is a third aspect connected to something we call big data. Uh, the more and more um, talk around there is about big data as a new buzzword for, for dealing with data. Many companies argue that this is the value, this is the real wealth they want to exploit. Many governments, probably also yours, mine for sure, argues that this is the way to go with managing the population, with you know, all the answers for, to the social problems now are, are in big data. What really is big data? Big data is science about human beings. Everybody who has big data, so the data about thousands, millions, uh, even more, I guess, Facebook, right? It's quite big now, <laughs> bigger than China. Uh, whoever has that kind of data set is really able to move from observation of individuals to the science about human beings. And they all say one thing, looking at big data, we can actually see the correlations that are not obvious for anybody. So when you have a million of people behaving in a certain way, reading certain articles, posting certain pictures, reacting in a certain way, watching this, you can actually guess things that they hide, they actively hide. I'm pretty sure that you must have heard of the research done by Cambridge University. It was quite uh, broadly commented like maybe two years ago they did it. Small research, really, but already revealing a lot. They took Facebook data, Facebook data about what people liked, just the publicly available stuff, just things that are, uh, you know, uh, uh, on the face of it, they seem very innocent. Things like that I share article about whatever, Rio de Janeiro or traveling or shoes or food. I like that picture, another picture. On that basis, they were actually able to identify hidden characteristics of people, like sexual orientation, like ethnicity, like political views, like the level of IQ, like the fact that the parents of these people divorced in the past, stuff like that. How come? That's, that's the trick of big data. With a big sample enough, <laughs> if, if you have the, and the sample is big enough, you can actually start building these correlations on the basis of uh, apparently innocent information. And that's another layer of the of, the, of the, 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 the power hidden in data, which people completely don't realize, I believe, because they don't think 
why how people how how companies and governments can can build on the data data sets they have including predicting our behavior so from that of course you can imagine all kinds of uses of data right from selling us uh, flight at higher price because uh, the company knows that we are in urgent need to go to europe because somebody died uh, to you know the choice of school for my kids to the political choice it, it's not inconceivable, and I would even claim it's already happening in the US, that big data will be used for political campaigns increasingly. So the person that has bigger access or, or easier access to, to, to this kind of technology, like Obama definitely had in his second um, run for, for, for the office, will be able to target people so precisely that they will be winning, not because they're objectively the best, but because they know how to convince, right? So we basically come back to advertising, the old school advertising that we thought, okay, that's part of capitalism, we probably have to live with advertising. But nobody, when advertising started, predicted that it will get to that point, that those who advertise to us, whatever they advertise, commercial, political, or, or life choices, will be able to actually get knowledge about our secret dreams, fears, needs, you know, our character, basically. And that's, that's the, the probably the major problem I see with data and the major problems that I bring to people when they say, oh, I have nothing to hide. It's really not about hiding things. It is about sharing. We want to be able to share. And I always say, we don't advocate for people to hide things. No, we advocate for people to have control over what they share with whom. And if you think about it, the more I share, probably the more control I need to keep, right? Because the one thing I don't share is probably the one I really want to keep secret. Right? So the, the more I, I create myself online, the more I will be careful of not revealing the, the, the real me sitting behind my screen and, and not being so nice and so cool as the one I project online. But also, the more I want to keep control over how this data is used for all the purposes I described. Do you want to yeah. follow? Uh, okay. I think it works. Okay. Um, Voy a hablar en castellano o prefieren que hable inglés. ¿Me entienden en castellano? Si hablo lento. Sí. Ok. <ríe> Prefiero castellano, pero. <ríe> eh, pero si prefieren que hable en inglés, puedo hablar en inglés. Um, un poquito para hablar. Uh, quiero presentar. Bueno, Calle se ha focalizado mucho en el problema de de las empresas y la información que comparten o que uno comparte. Pero para nosotros en la IFF también nos preocupa mucho lo que el Estado puede hacer. Nuestra organización, como dijo, nos presentaron, se fundó en 1990 y desde el 2005 venimos eh, demandando a la NSA, a la National Security Agency, en los Estados Unidos, por eh, violación inconstitucional de la población. Lo que sucedió fue que un día eh, un whistleblower, un técnico de la empresa AT&T, vino a las of oficinas de IFF y habló con la, la persona que estaba en la puerta y comenzó a decir, tengo evidencia de que el gobierno americano está eh, haciendo una copia de todas las comunicaciones que pasan por eh, las oficinas de AT&T. Por suerte que la, la persona que está en la oficina dijo, eh, ¿este es loco o es en verdad una persona, me entiendes, seria? En verdad, se veía una persona muy seria. Entonces, por suerte, llamó a uno de nuestros abogados, quien lo invitó a pasar a la oficina y él mostró evidencia que había un cuarto secreto dentro de las oficinas de AT&T en el cual todo el tráfico de internet se desviaba ahí toda la señal de, una, de la fibra óptica por donde pasan nuestras comunicaciones en los Estados Unidos, se desviaba a este cuarto eh, eh, secreto, que estaba a unas cuadras de nuestra oficina, en Folsom Street, en la calle de Folsom. Entonces, desde ahí la IFF decidió primero demandar a AT&T por ser cómplice en esa vigilancia ilegal de las comunicaciones. Y o por otro lado... Eh, decidimos también demandar al gobierno americano. Lamentablemente, en el primer caso, o podríamos decir también que nos sentimos orgullosos, el gobierno de Estados Unidos aprobó una norma que daba inmunidad retroactiva a AT&T por cualquier 
ayuda en la vigilancia por temas de seguridad nacional. Entonces, lo perdimos el caso. Primero, es un absurdo desde el punto de vista legal dar inmunidad retroactiva a una, a una empresa. Primero, porque las normas siempre son a futuro, no para hacia atrás. Pero bueno, perdimos ese caso y digo orgullosos porque, bueno, nosotros estábamos iniciando el litigio en el cual pensamos que podíamos ganar. Entonces, como que a raíz de nuestro caso pasó eso. Entonces, pero sin embargo, nuestro caso contra el gobierno americano sigue pendiente. Y en esos inicios lo que sucedió es que el gobierno americano, en caso que estoy hablando muy rápido, el gobierno americano eh, no quería avanzar el caso, estaba deteniendo el caso para que vaya muy lento, por argumentando que era un tema de privilegio del secreto. Es decir, un tema de seguridad nacional, el cual no se podía discutir la sustancia. Entonces, a raíz de Snowden, eh, uno de los primeros leaks que Snowden publica justamente era aquel que confirmaba la información que Mark Klein había hecho, que Verizon, eh, Ver Verizon, que es una empresa de telecomunicaciones, había también tenía una orden que era masiva, que permitía la recolección de todos los datos de quién se comunica con quién y desde dónde, de manera masiva. Entonces, eh, Snowden reconfirmó esa información, pero no solo reconfirmó, sino que además expuso nueva información en el debate. Puso en el debate una gran cantidad de nuevas tecnologías que se están siendo utilizadas para espiar a la población. Además, no solo eso, sino que mostró a través de los leaks que se está explotando los sistemas de seguridad buscando eh, buscar eh, fallos en los sistemas de seguridad, lo que nos protegen y son esenciales para todo tipo de comunicaciones, o sea, nuestras comunicaciones financieras, navegación anónima para proteger nuestra privacidad, conversar con nuestras familias, o inclusive si eres un profesor y quieres guardar las pruebas del examen de manera segura para que no un, un estudiante eh, experto ahí pueda conseguir las pruebas, el examen antes de él de que se den las pruebas, ¿no? Entonces, eh, todo ha sido, ha sido un problema, pero el que ha puesto en, en juego esto es, uno, que las tecnologías han bajado, o sea, el tema de las tecnologías, del precio de las tecnologías han bajado, mucho más masiva, países hasta muy pobres como Etiopía tienen tecnologías que son sumamente intrusivas, las normas de derecho penal o de derecho procesal penal o de telecomunicaciones, no se han actualizado, siguen dispersas y siguen muy desordenadas. No, eh, no se hay un debate público si, por ejemplo, la herramienta A o B de vigilancia es realmente una herramienta proporcional o necesaria, o si realmente es necesaria, teniendo en cuenta que ya tienen muchos poderes la policía, y están comenzando a utilizar herramientas sumamente intrusivas, por ejemplo, como el malware, el cual toma control de tu computadora, puede hacer grabaciones de lo que dices o tomarte fotos sin que te des cuenta. Y no hay ni siquiera un debate si eso es legal o no, o si es legal porque es particularizado, qué tipo de estándar hay que utilizar. Porque tal vez el estándar legal para utilizar una herramienta de esas, debe ser inclusive más alta que el estándar que usas para interceptación de comunicaciones, wiretapping. Entonces, pero no hay debate público, están utilizando esas herramientas y en los códigos legales están muy atrasados. Entonces, un poquito quería poner el tema en el debate para seguir discutiendo lo que se podría hacer aquí, cuál es el rol de Brasil en este debate internacional, porque esto no es un solo un tema de, a nivel nacional o que está sucediendo en los Estados Unidos. Una de las cosas que nos hemos enterado es la vigilancia masiva que hacen los Estados Unidos a todos los ciudadanos del mundo. Entonces, eh, ¿cuál es el rol de Brasil y qué se puede pedir al gobierno para que efectivamente nos ayude en esta lucha? No sé si... Ok, bueno... Well. 
I'm also going to apologize for having to speak in English uh, because my Portuguese is non-existent. But thank you very much for having me. And what I want to do is kind of bridge um, what Kasha and Kat were saying and kind of, I think, bring them together a little bit. Kasha was talking about big data and this wealth of information about all of us that exists. It exists online, on Facebook and Google. It exists on our cell phone. Uh, which is a miniature computer, but really also a miniature, you know, a massive diary of who we communicate with and has pictures and messages. And, and Kat was talking about the NSA surveillance scandal. And the whole reason the NSA surveillance scandal exists is because of the power of big data. It's because of that wealth of information can be extremely revealing. And in the NSA scandal, the U.S. government and other governments across the world who are doing similar types of data analysis and data mining are trying to use that information to uh, learn about threats to national security and terrorism. And what I want to say is, you know, when we talk about surveillance and when we talk about big data, one of the arguments that governments always raise, and it doesn't matter whether it's a government in South America, in the United States, in Europe, it's always the same argument, that the cyber criminals are a step ahead, that um, all the crime is online, that we have to stop child pornography. And I think the response to that and something to think about in the debates in the uh, effort to fight legislation is to remind the public and to remind the policymakers that we live in a golden age of surveillance. We live in a, in a time of unprecedented access to information about us. Thirty years ago, if the police stopped you on the street, what are the chances that they would find your diary in your pocket? Okay? Maybe, they would, maybe some people carried a diary in their pocket, probably not many people, but at least a few people, and maybe that diary has six months of entry in it, or maybe it's only got a few weeks. Today, any time the police stop someone in the street, they have this diary, right? The cell phone diary. It has pictures and email and text message and my web history and apps. It has my financial information. It has my whole life. This is something that never existed 20 years ago. And today, anytime the police pull someone over in any city, anywhere in the world, they're getting all of this. That is a new thing that did not exist 20 years ago. If the police wanted to know where I was six months ago, 20 years ago, they would be out of luck. They would have no way of knowing. Today, if the police want to know where I am six months ago, they just call my cell phone company and they say, give me his cell phone connection records. And they're going to get a record of where I was six months ago. And not where I was one time six months ago, but where I was in the morning and where I was in the afternoon and where I was in the evening. And then they can look and analyze that information and determine, you know, where do I live? Where do I work? Where do I go to have a drink? Where do I go to see my mistress? Where do I go anywhere, right? Uh, so again, we're talking about a new age, a golden age of surveillance. So anytime you hear the argument that the government or the police are going to make, which is we need more power to keep the people safe, we need data retention, we need um, greater surveillance capabilities, remind them that their surveillance capabilities today are at a level that has never before been seen in you know, the history of the world. I mean, I know that sounds very generic, but it's the truth, um, that they have powerful capabilities that have never been replicated before, and that it's important that with that, responsibility, with that power comes some responsibility to cabin and be narrow about how they can use and deploy those, this very powerful technology on the general public, and how they can um, conduct surveillance in a way that's consistent with human rights principles. Because ultimately, it's never, you know, I understand that there's going to be some need for law enforcement, for police to get information from a cell phone company, from Facebook. I understand that there's a need to protect the public, but the important thing to remember is that that protection of the public cannot completely um, you know, eat up the, the human rights, you know, principles and obligations that we have and that should be embodied in the, you know, domestic law, international law, it doesn't matter. That, the, you know, these, these rights and these principles are important and they're worth preserving and technology has the capability to encroach upon those protections and it's important for us to fight and push and resist back to the extent that we can. So I'll just leave it at that and then, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions afterwards. Oi.
eu vou falar em português mesmo, se me permite. Eu vou fazer uma pequena contribuição, um pequeno contraponto aqui, nem vou tratar é, com muita ênfase em temas relacionados à vigilância, à tecnologia, mas apenas dar um relance sobre um tema subjacente a todo esse discurso, que seria nos perguntar, o problema está bem posto, é evidente, o problema da vigilância, e agora, pragmaticamente, como encaminhar um eventual, é, uma eventual solução para isso? De que forma, é, concretamente, o, aqui me põe no lugar, o regulador, o Estado, pode, o Estado ou a sociedade pode pressionar o Estado para que algo seja feito a respeito? O... Uma regulação, uma solução para o problema da vigilância e da proteção de dados é, alguma coisa que, é algo que encerra algumas, alguns problemas e contradições que não são facilmente solucionáveis. O problema da vigilância, no fundo, é um problema de concorrência também. Os estados concorrem uns um contra os outros. Os blocos comerciais, é, posições políticas, é, etnias, concorrem todas umas contra as outras. E pelo mesmo motivo que quem trabalha numa empresa, num escritório, tem, não gosta de ir para casa encerrar o trabalho antes, porque o concorrente vai trabalhar a noite adentro e vai ter uma oportunidade maior, não é muito fácil convencer um governo a abrir mão da sua capacidade, do seu potencial de vigilância, enquanto os outros potenciais inimigos não vão fazer o mesmo. Chegar num meio termo, num lugar comum, num tratado de não proliferação, para vigilância é um problema que talvez encerre maiores problemas até do que para tratar de não proliferação nucleares. É um problema muito complicado. E muito embora uma pressão muito grande da sociedade civil, uma, uma, um senso comum é, implementado dentro de uma cultura, uma população, pode ser é, um movimentos muito importantes para que faça-se algo a respeito, efetivamente fazer algo a respeito, implica é, em abrir mão de uma parcela de, digamos assim, de uma segurança que talvez muitos estados não estejam, eu diria talvez a maioria, dispostos a fazer e correr risco que talvez possa colocar algumas pessoas de bem em dúvida sobre se estarão fazendo certo para com a própria população. O problema é muito complicado. É... E eu não tenho uma solução para isso, eu quero colocar essa questão, mas o que eu também verifico é que o encaminhamento dessa, dessa questão e, pelo menos, a equalização de problemas referentes à vigilância e aqui a proteção de dados também em alguns países, passa sempre através de uma movimentação cultural, de uma conscientização, de uma... É de uma modificação de alguns padrões de comportamento de uma sociedade, de valores nos quais os dados pessoais, a informação pessoal, passa a ser tida, a ser tomada como alguma coisa de mais valiosa, alguma coisa de importante. Uma, um povo que não se preocupa muito com seus dados tende a não se preocupar tanto que ele seja utilizado por uma empresa quanto que ele é, é ser vigiado. O fato de, no Brasil, nós comumente, é, tradicionalmente, eu falo nós, a maioria da população, não nos importarmos muito com câmaras de vigilância e muitas vezes achamos que isso é um bem, é, é, um, é, é uma intrusão mínima que se justifica amplamente por termos de segurança, denota que na no, nossa sensibilidade, aqui eu digo até justificadamente por muitos motivos, nós estamos muito propensos, por viver num clima de segurança social e pessoal bastante grande, a, a, fazer, a, a trocar, a abrir mão de uma parcela dessa nossa intimidade por algo mais de segurança, muito embora essa segurança possa ser irreal, possa ser ilusória ou possa vir acompanhada de problemas maiores até do que a insegurança física. Bom, é, o que eu pelo menos posso verificar, ter verificado nos últimos três, quatro anos, é que houve certamente uma certa mudança na impressão, no, 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 na tábua de valores da população, no sentido de privilegiar um pouco mais a, a utilização dos próprios dados. De, a, o, a questão do Snowden foi muito importante, mas mesmo fora desse ponto, a utilização de dados pessoais no Brasil costuma é, estar cada vez mais é, sendo vista como algo que pode afetar de alguma forma a vida das pessoas e, como tal, algo que deve merecer uma visão mais é, detalhada, tanto do regulador quanto do próprio cidadão quanto o seu uso. Nesse sentido, uma das opções que o regulador pode ter e que não vai resolver propriamente o sistema da vigilância, mas pode e deve muito contribuir para a modificação, para a criação, para o fomento de uma cultura de respeito à privacidade, à proteção de dados no país, é a estipulação de regras mais claras e protetivas e garantistas a respeito da utilização de dados pessoais 
por empresas, pelo governo, dar as peças no cidadão. Nesse sentido, uma proposta, existem as propostas que estão sendo discutidas, que em certa medida já foram implementadas em algumas leis, como o marco civil, como a lei do cadastro positivo, como a própria lei de acesso à informação, que procuram fornecer ao cidadão alguns instrumentos, alguns meios jurídicos para que ele possa defender com maior efetividade seus próprios direitos em relação a seus dados pessoais. Essa lei é uma é uma parcela, uma, é um passo na solução de um problema que é gigantesco, mas como eu sempre gosto de lembrar o professor Stefano Rolotal, um professor italiano que por uma boa parte da vida se ocupou desse tema, ele sempre falava que nenhuma legislação vai ser eficaz se não houver uma modificação na cultura, no bojo, do, 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 da ânima de uma população que faça com que ela perceba a importância de respeitar, de tratar com mais cuidado os seus próprios dados pessoais. Essa modificação, penso eu, é a minha opinião sincera, já está, se não consolidada, de certa forma, em curso, em operação no Brasil. E, nesse sentido, é, vale a pena prestar atenção em medidas normativas que, muito embora hoje em dia, ninguém tenha uma solução para o problema da vigilância governamental. Ninguém, pelo menos que eu tenha... É, visto com afim com, a denúncias a formas de abordar o problema mas pelo menos uma coisa que o Brasil tem espaço para andar e deve é, tentar resolver é fornecer pelo menos o plano do, do da fomento de direitos individuais mais garantias mais remédios para a proteção de dados pessoais de seus cidadãos nesse sentido algumas leis andaram nesse sentido nesse sentido é também deve ser verificadas com atenção algumas propostas como uma que o Ministério da Justiça anunciou que muito proximamente vai colocar em debate público, que é referente a um projeto de lei que trata justamente da proteção de dados pessoais. Abarcando uma parcela desse problema, porém uma parcela significativa, uma parcela essencial para que o Brasil possa, é, até no foro internacional de peito erguido e cabeça é, alta, afirmar que, juntamente com o apoio à resolução 6714 da Assembleia Geral das Nações Unidas sobre direito à privacidade na era digital, também se preocupa não só com a vigilância no aspecto no, 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 no foro internacional, mas também com a é, garantia de que seus cidadãos estejam individualmente protegidos contra o mau uso de seus dados. E é só esse contraponto que eu queria fornecer para começar a discussão. Por... Muito obrigado, Danilo. Bom, gente, eu queria abrir para a discussão. Eu, pelo menos, já tenho duas perguntas. I have two questions that I already want to make. But before I ask them, deixa eu abrir para o pessoal para ver se tem perguntas. E esse é o, é o momento. Vamos lá. Vamos lá. Só se apresentar antes. E... Hi, uh, my name is Rodrigo Batista. Uh, I work uh, with Bitcoin, so I'm very interested in the subject. Uh, I have like about 10 questions here, but uh, I, I, <laughs> I will go for one first. Um, what about the, the whole, uh, the role of the market? Because uh, uh, lately we see initiatives like Apple uh, now has uh, uh, cryptography built in, in their new iPhones. Androids uh, ha has that, uh, have that as well. Uh, we have uh, initiatives of um, safe emails like ProtoMail in Switzerland. So, uh, do you think that the market will have like an important uh, important role to fill the gap like that the government, for example, are, are uh, today have? Can I can I give a quick answer? I think I think absolutely, and I think one of the best things that came out of the whole Snowden story is that. The companies, and I mean the big companies like Microsoft and Google, realize that it is good for business to be more private. I, I wouldn't say they're completely private. I think there's still work to be done. But they are. But there's, I think, a growing recognition that privacy is a commodity that's good for business, particularly um, for you know. And I just mentioned a bunch of U.S. companies particularly when it comes to doing business outside of the United States, where there is strong you know, data protection laws and where there is, a, I think, a stronger sense of you know, what should remain private. And so absolutely, and I think market-based solutions are a, a component of a, 
a total approach. So there has to be, you know, technology solutions, which in, include marketplace solutions. There has to be legal solutions. There has to be a societal solution, meaning people have to stop thinking that I have nothing to hide and so nothing to fear. Um, I mean, all of those things have to work together if we want to have any sort of meaningful change in terms of what remains private in, in the digital age. Can I, uh, it's just that we, we always in Europe are kind of more skeptical towards market solutions, so maybe only for that reason, but not only. Just add one thing. Yes, I agree. I agree with Hani totally, but there is one but. I mean, whenever you give your data to a company, you give your data to a company. I mean, nothing will change that, okay? Apart from end-to-end -end encryption. So apart from business models that are based or enable end-to-end -end encryption so that at no point the data gets into somebody's cloud or somebody's server, I think the problem remains more or less the same. So like you, you saw, for example, WhatsApp at some point. WhatsApp, was it? The one where it disappears, the apparently the messages? Uh, Snapchat, sorry, Snapchat. Uh, apparently was used by many teenagers as a response to, to Facebook's policy of keeping all their stuff and inviting parents to watch it. Of course, it's exactly the same cloud, right? And of course, the, the, the leaks we had recently from Snapchat just revealed that everything remains there. The, the interface is only different. So just the one bad is let's be very careful in making assessments of these models. Uh, new, more privacy-enhancing models, cool. But as long as the data really travels from your device anywhere else, unencrypted, the problem more or less remains the same. Uh, I have uh, one comment. I just want to say that um, I don't disagree with Kasha. I just want to say, provide one example of how the market is responding. We recently hear that Yahoo want to actually develop end-to-end -end encryption in their email. And that's a huge development because if one internet company start providing... Let's wait until they uh, uh, Yeah, but uh, they hire one of our technologies they steal it <laughs> to work on that. <laughs> so uh, it's a good, it's a, yeah, and she, it, that's her project. I don't know if they will do it, you know, let's see it. But I think the fact that they have worked on that and said that they will provide that, that can change a little the debate. And we need them, you know, and we need Bitcoin. Perguntas? <laughs> I just bought a Dell computer and it comes with McAfee in it and the contract I, I took the time to read it it says it can send my voice my image to the US government if they want I don't know why but I, I just want to comment something I forgot to say yeah um, so today, I read the news uh, about Cisco, that they are losing their profits in markets like Brazil and Russia because the hardware is in the U.S. and they blame the U.S. government because of the NSA scandal. So that's a good thing, I think, because it's pressuring the government that they have to do something because this is huge, it's global, and it's affecting business. Just, just one sentence on the Bitcoin. Uh, it does for me. Bitcoin is incredible development towards, of course, more, more freedom, more, more freedom in various interactions that need money. But that only shows your case. For example, in Poland, as non-government organization, we cannot use Bitcoin because we would immediately get into money anti-money laundering regulations, and we would we would get in a lot of trouble just for the using the Bitcoin, like enabling people to send us Bitcoins. So, for me, what you do opens yet another debate, like we talk about the regulation here, but think how many layers of regulation we, you really have to struggle now with. It's not only the regulation that enables NSA to grab our data, it's also many other layers of regulation apparently to protect us from various threats like terrorism or, or financing terrorism, whatever, that actually block many of the good initiatives. So the fight is more, even more complex. Kasha, uh, we have another question here, uh, but before that, I just would like to comment that it's an interesting regulation in Poland about the Bitcoin. If that happened, I think ITS would be doing money laundering because we accept donations in Bitcoin. 
We haven't received any, but like, uh, if you guys want to donate in Bitcoin, we are open yeah. for that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. you, you, you. Yeah, it's true. But you donated in highs. You know that, that was good. That is good. Next time, Bitcoin, it's open. So the same. The same for EFF. We received Bitcoins, <laughs> and we actually did. We have to do a legal analysis to deal with that. I think we cash it immediately. We don't leave it. We don't have. Bitcoins in the cloud, <laughs> yeah. but we just uh, have to cash it immediately. So. Okay, sounds good. We have another question here. Uh, boa noite, né? Uh, I want to address to the the issue of uh, retention uh, retention of data, in, because uh, as we see from here in Europe, as example, uh, that issue is people is against. It. So it's kind of absurd. In Brazil, we have the Marx view. And it's, it's regulated, and people didn't fight too much. So I, I want to see like both opinion. As a guy who worked for the the Minister of Justice and has a lot of study on that, and and for you guys, like because for us, like we see a high up is a tremendous collective. We do a lot of work. We'll be a criminal to be here because they don't that they don't keep data. And in here we have six months, one year. So the Artigo 13, 12, 15, 16. So I want to see that, like uh, you guys talking, like because in Europe I know people, you made effort that that's an absurd. You cannot keep data. This is for vigilance or whatever. So I want to 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 hear opinions on that because in Brazil it sounds like we didn't fight against that. I can comment and then I will leave it to Kasha because she has fought um, data retention in Europe. But in my case, I have been fighting data retention in Latin America, actually. I just been back from Paraguay when we have been debating data retention because we f believe it's it's create a uh, it chill free expression. For instance, it will re well f for everyone who are not familiar with data retention, it compel telecom telecom companies or ISPs to collect the IP address, uh, who communicate with whom, for how long, and from and when, uh, how often. Uh, this data, which is minimum, because you say, why I will care with an IP address? But when you mine this information and you correlate it with other IP address, you can determine patterns of behavior. And um, so it, it, the fact that they are retaining the data of all the population for future use for law enforcement is just changing the pres presumptions of innocence, turning them into possible uh, how is it, suspects. suspects or crime. When I am a citizen, I'm innocent, and so there is no reason to surveil me. And so this is a crucial principle of the rule of law that we should be fighting for strongly. In addition, uh, I think it's also crucial because it affects, for instance, my my, converse, my privacy of communications. If I'm a journalist, with my sources. So you, the, as a journalist, you have to protect your sources. But if they are collecting the data of with whom you're communicating with, your source will be be able to be identified. The same if in a doctor and with a patient, or if I'm a lawyer with a client. And so this deletion of anonymity of this uh, law that just chill free expression, privacy and association should be should not be permissible in a democratic society, in our opinion. So we have been fighting this right now in Paraguay. And the government said we have to fight child porn. We have to fight terrorism. I said so what I did is I did a presentation of what I know more or less the police current powers to surveil. So I show them how they can track people in real time, or even in his historical time for a brief period of time, with the current powers that they have right now. So after I did the presentations, the, the policymaker told me, why do I need more retention? Why do, why do the police need more powers? So we have to ask, it's OK to fight child porn, to fight terrorism, because those are serious crime. But you have to show why do you really need more powers and why, um, what you're going to do it 
you have to present the evidence of what you're gonna do it right now, what is have to be necessity, have to be proportionate, how you show that that is a proportionate measure. And so we changed the debate from being losing to now say that it's actually a, a, a tool for surveil the whole population. Um, yes, it's a very important uh, um, twist or, or if you can imagine the table where we sit and it's very important to, to turn the table and make the government, whenever they propose new surveillance measure, we be that data retention or anything else, that they always have to be the one proving that this additional intervention, additional intrusion in, in our fundamental rights is necessary. Uh, and they have to produce evidence. So we often say, well, in the democratic society, you basically, um, uh, you basically build um, new policies on the premise of evidence. If you don't have evidence to prove that without these additional measures, the, the rate of your crime, uh, whatever, uh, I, I don't know the, the, the proper term for that, but you know the, de the crime detection, I guess, will be dropping or whatever else will happen, negative. You should not go further than, than you have now. And I really like Hani's take on this, saying that we already live in the golden age of, of surveillance. We have so many capabilities of, uh, of obtaining data, right? So in even more, we should be asking question why, why another layer of that uh, is possible. So having said that, I, I, I strongly agree with Katica, but on the other hand, uh, if, you, if you think twice about this argument that we, there's already a lot of data out there, right? What are we really saying now? We are saying basically data is available. Data is retained for many other reasons, okay? When we say data retention, we can, there are two meanings. One is the obligation, the legal obligation to keep data, the one that was, I, I understand, introduced by Marco Civil, and the one we have in Europe as well. So the obligation to keep data. Another thing is the, the, the de facto retention, the fact that many companies, many entities just keep data for many reasons, for commercial transactions, for, for, task purp for, for tax purposes, for money, anti -money, money laundering regulations. There are many contexts, legal and, and, and practical, that that enable or force even retaining data. So as a matter of fact, by saying no data retention, we say there is enough data, but it's worth considering whether we should not be, whether we should not be fighting this, right? You know what I'm getting at? So we all look at obligatory data retention as the main enemy, and we sort of forget that there is so much data out there anyway. And many, co in Poland, I can give you this example when we were fighting data retention and we were saying, let's keep it as short as possible. So we went down from two years to one year and we thought it was a nice victory. Somebody came from the DPA office, the Data Protection Authority, and say, do you realize that companies keep it for even 10 years just because they can and just because nobody really controls them and nobody really gets into the databases to check? And I thought, fuck, this is much bigger problem, probably, because de facto, the police can come and still grab that data, even if there is no legal obligation. So it's just to show you that things are not so easy. And it's not like no data retention in the law, cool. No, data is out there. And that's on one hand argument for us to fight the obligation to retain it for a certain time. On the other hand, it's another field of battle that we have to uh, keep open. But on the European situation, we are we kind of changed strategy from fighting retention as such for all these reasons and we moved to saying, okay, data is there. What we really need is very strong safeguards on the use of this data and access to this data. We probably will not win all the fights against keeping data, but we can introduce very strong safeguards. So for example, the data is there for whatever reason, obligate, legal obligation or something else. Police, secret services should never be able to just go and grab it, right? In Poland, they can even, they don't have to go anywhere. They just have a cable linking, seriously, they have their own access to database of telecom communication, uh, telecom, uh, telecom companies. They just do searches in their databases. That's crazy. That's, that's exactly what we fight in the first place. So maybe think of Marco Civil and your situation. Okay, you have a data retention. Fine. It's not very good news. But maybe instead of fighting the mere retention, which will be very difficult, I believe. They already lost. 
let's think of what safeguards we can bring into play so that this data cannot be just used for anybody in the police or anybody in your military police or your intelligence service or any other officials for reasons that are not strictly necessary and not, and not really beneficial for the society. And that's the conversation we can have maybe later. Very good. Um so, little Ronaldo, que o Ernesto mencionou. Vai lá, vai lá, Danilo. Só ver se não. Vamos lá, vai lá, vai lá. Só até o um comentário, o Ernesto mencionou o Ministério da Justiça. Eu, eu trabalho no Ministério da Justiça, só. Não, não tem problema nenhum. É um comentário só. Eu trabalho na Secretaria do Consumidor, que, que não é absolutamente afetada pela questão da retenção de dados. Por isso, me sinto confortável para responder na minha capacidade pessoal. E em relação à retenção de dados, o que ocorre com o Marco Civil é sim, é uma lei que institui a retenção obrigatória de dados, não só de conexão, mas de aplicativos, aplicações na internet. Isso deve ser visto em retrospectivo no sentido do Marco Civil, foi uma lei de reação a um projeto que criminalizava algumas atitudes na internet e que parte do consenso que gerou o Marco Civil como é hoje, partia do pressuposto que ele iria incluir uma solução é, com aquelas soluções de retenção de dados, imbuída também de garantias e salvaguardas, que vejamos, vamos ver agora de que forma aplicadas, de que forma que gere um mínimo de segurança, um mínimo de respeito às áreas pessoais. Em relação ao trabalho de retenção de dados, o que nós fomos observando, que até com vistas a possíveis desdobramentos regulatórios, Pesquisas dizem que países que instituíram regimes de retenção obrigatória de dados não necessariamente é, tiveram um maior sucesso na persecução penal. A mudança estatística foi próxima a zero. Isso é, é claro, é necessário fazer estudos com determinado critério, mas nada indica que haja uma garantia suprema de que a retenção de dados vai sim facilitar o tanto assim o trabalho das forças de ordem. É claro que, ao que parece, várias forças de ordem se sentem muito mais confortáveis com a retenção de dados do que com outras formas alternativas. Enfim, a opção que o legislador brasileiro fez foi para instituir a retenção obrigatória de dados e é sempre necessário lembrar também que, o fato, a particularidade do Marco Civil de ter dois regimes diferenciados de retenção de dados, tanto para a camada de conteúdo quanto na camada da conexão, aparece também já com uma medida de salvaguarda, que deve ser tomada com bastante critério e cuidado, para, para que possa, de fato, representar uma garantia. Isso é, tanto o acesso somente mediante ordem judicial, quanto a absoluta incomunicabilidade entre dados e conexão e dados de acesso à aplicação. Como... É, trabalhar isso daqui para diante, garantindo por meios regulatórios, técnicos e pela, pelos mecanismos de pressão e de opinião pública necessários para que essa separação funcione de fato. É uma, é uma solução, de certa forma, inovadora no legislador brasileiro, que necessita também de meios de, de, de é, absorção, de efetivação por meio do mercado, por meio daqueles que tratam dados, para que ele de fato sirva como uma salvaguarda específica. Uh, my, no my name is Guilherme Prega. I work in a uh, utility company in Brazil. Uh, my English is not very good. I will try to formulate my question in the clearest way. So uh, we are, I, I make things a little more complex because we are talking about the pr private concerns, concerns about protecting private data uh, about closing or controlling the access of private data, but there is a, the opposite side. There is a public claim uh, uh, for uh, more public access to data from governments, from companies, because of uh, issues like corruption, like uh, crimes, state crimes. From uh, In Brazil, we have the Truth Commission, who which which is investigating crimes uh, during the military uh, period uh, in Brazil so you have the other side you have we must have access also to m many data which is hidden and 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 which is protected in some archives we don't know where and many times old. We don't know really what happened in, in the 60s, in the 70s, 70s about 
state crimes because we don't know don't we don't have no not meant no more information the information have disappeared so uh, i think that you have the other side also we call here uh, in brazil transparency transparency a claim for transparency of the information so i i want to, uh, the experts to talk about this other side of the question quickly comment That's the easy question. <laughs> no, very good point. Of course, there is always the other side. But I'm, I'm, I'm joking. It's easy for us because we, we have, we applied this quite straightforward, straightforward approach to, to, to privacy and transparency, which basically says that the more power, the more responsibility, the more transparency. So if you happen to be a public official, or, or, or basically you have power from the people or from, from, from the elections or even as a company, you have higher level of responsibility for your actions, including transparency. Very often we will not even talk about privacy here because we will not even talk about private individuals. I believe here you, you mentioned, I don't know the, 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 the situation in Brazil, the files you mentioned, the archives, I believe there might be some also private information, right? That's why you bring it. Uh, in my country, we also have, uh, you know, like we had previous regime and there were things happening in the previous regime, like people cooperating with the, with the government and there are files on them and there is a whole mess about we open the files or we don't open the files. Yes, all these debates, there are difficult ones and you have to find the right balance. But, but really, when we say more privacy or more control over data, I don't see contradiction here. Because, uh, because as I say, I mean, the, 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 more, the, more, the more power, the more transparency. Uh, the key thing is probably who decides on that borderline, who, who, who says that that particular individual should reveal more. For example, that my archive about my past should be public because I was, I don't know, a spy or, or cooperating with my regime or maybe because I was a politician, right? These are tricky situations, and I think my point is that it should be always the judge. It should be the judicial decision on these things, because it's not, uh, it's not black or white, and it shouldn't be the government or the public or the journalists deciding what information goes public, what not. But, but in terms of um, the direction we go, we act activists that work anti-surveillance often work hand in hand with activists for transparency. We see this as the same battle because we really use information on both sides. We use information to control power. So for example, I obtain a lot of information about the state, about, uh, I ask how many times they ask about my data. I ask how many times they use certain surveillance technology, right? So I send a lot of requests for data to make data work for us. At the same time, I want to protect our data because we are citizens, we are not holding power, and our data should be protected. So that's the general approach appreciating that there can be clashes, which I think is for the judicial branch to decide. Muito bom. Okay. I ask this question because it's not simply just let's erase the database. Because the database, it's about memory. And it's about collect collective memory also. We always are trying to understand the past, not only of of government but also people individuals and and many people have auto uh, have biographies and historians looking for his or her life and so it's not simply to 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 ask for let's erase the database of about my, about my life it's not so simple as that oh i never said to erase have i no i mean of course, I mean, if you have information, information can be... I even started when, in, in my first intervention, I said, we want control and sharing. If somebody wants to have database of his life or from the past, their archives or whatever, and publish a book on that or use it, please. I mean, that's all about control and, and controlled sharing and awareness of what we do. It's not... I never advocate for erasing data. I think data is cool. It can be a lot of power for us too. It's just who has data has the power. Let's not destroy it. Yes, it's interesting to keep it sometimes. 
vou passar para você. Antes de passar para o Lucas fazer uma pergunta, só avisar que quem está sentado aqui, está por aqui, pode fazer perguntas também, fica à vontade. E quem está no fundo também, o fundo está muito tímido aí, podem ficar à vontade também fazer perguntas. Vou passar mais uma excepcionalmente aqui para frente, depois vamos ver se a gente distribui melhor. Vai lá, Lucas. É, first speaking em português, uh, pra, uh, relativo a essa questão da, das biografias, dessa questão da, do balanço entre a privacidade e o direito à memória coletiva, tem um artigo naquele livro que está sendo distribuído ali, eu não sei, não lembro o título nem quem escreveu, é, mas que fala justamente dessa questão de, de como, mais bota a questão do que dar uma solução, sobre como fazer esse balanço. And now speaking in, in English, uh, normally the, the debate about, uh, about who has control of data and how government uses it is framed around individuals, uh, the individual's right to privacy, which, uh, which is maybe very strong in, 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 U in the U.S. because of the Constitution amendments. But there is always a uh, there is also a way to frame this around freedom of expression and freedom of association, and the freedom of groups, not individuals, to communicate. Because uh, privacy is not a a an individual right. Okay, if you if you if if someone watches your conversation, he, he's not only watching you; he's watching everyone you talk to. So. If we could somehow find a way to frame this into uh, freedom of, of expression instead of privacy, which is a, a word that not always uh, resonates with, with people's ideas, maybe it could somehow uh, engage people in, the, in this battle. Because here in Brazil we have the, the ditadura, in which people were like tortured to, 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 to tell who they were communicating with, who were their, their friends, who were their, their, their names. And right now, if you go to the right database, you have all this information, no need to, to, to put people's face in the water to, 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 to know this information. And uh, I don't know if the common citizen is, is, is sensibilized by, by this, but uh, the political debate is, is very strong in this in the sense of of uh, sabotaging uh, political groups and and knowing people's contacts i i just was going to say briefly which you actually should say it uh when we're talking about surveillance whether it is uh or privacy it's more about liberty versus control so this is how we see surveillance and within that d debate we know that surveillance infringe upon several rights, especially free expression, anonymity, uh, my right to privacy, uh, to have communications privately, or association with whom I communicate with and from where. So I think that it's not so much about only privacy, but we see it, at least in EFF, it's more about freedom. Yeah, actually, to Just to say a specific example of that, um, Katitza was talking about some of the work EFF has done against the NSA. Well, after the Snowden leak, one of the things we did was we filed a lawsuit against the NSA, and we actually brought a claim under freedom of speech and freedom of association. And so in the lawsuit, we represent 23 or 24 different organizations from a variety of different groups. So we represent... It, so one of the organizations is Greenpeace. One organization is a church. One is a synagogue. One is a mosque. Um, one is gun owners. So we brought all these groups who are all associations, and we basically made an argument to the court that said, look, you know, when the, when the NSA collects phone records about who people communicate with, it, it chills their ability to speak freely because they are aware that government is listening or government is watching. And so I think, like Katitza was saying, these are not, uh, privacy and free expansion, expression do not, They're not in conflict with each other. They go hand in, they go together. They're partners, um, and you need one to enjoy the other. So you can't ha communicate freely if your communication is being monitored and you have no privacy. And the whole point of privacy, one of the the points of privacy, one of the reasons we want privacy is to communicate freely. So I think the important thing is to focus on both, and to bring any any challenge to surveillance has to encompass both. And you know, I, I talked about NSA, but it could be any form of surveillance is going to have that um, potential. You know, we talked about um, 
data retention. And one of the problems with data retention is, um, you know, IP logs identify who you communicate with and who you are, and where you are communicating from. And where you are communicating from can identify, you know, your affiliation. If you're communicating from a gay bar, that says one thing about you. If you're communicating from a uh, anarchist library, that's going to communicate a different thing about you. Um, and and so it's these are all they're all parts of human rights. So it's not it's not that one right is against the other right. It's that they all work together. And in, like Katitza was saying, when you talk about liberty, you're talking about liberty and individual freedom and human rights, and they all work hand in hand. Yeah, I can't agree more. It's exactly. Uh, but uh, your question just reminded me that we haven't said that, and maybe that's the first thing we should have said about surveillance. That, of course, not privacy. I mean, privacy is by no means a central value, and we never use it in our advocacy. Actually, we, we uh, kind of divert attention from privacy because privacy disturbs the message. Really, I mean, the message is about freedom, of course, and about various. Uh, various aspects of your life that will be limited somehow by, by the use of information, which is power. That's it. And privacy is just a tool, one of the tools. I rather think of privacy as a tool that can protect us more, never a goal in itself. I'm not fighting for privacy. I'm fighting for freedom and for more control over data on our side. But another uh, another aspect you, you raise, uh, the, 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 the kind of societal um, societal um, impact on, on privacy intrusions. It's never just my privacy, right? It's I communicate with others. If, so, if NSA or whoever, Facebook knows stuff about me, it usually knows stuff about my network, other people and all that. It's very important to raise that point more and more. And the best person, I guess, who's speaking, speaking on that so far is uh, Eben Moglen, the guy from Columbia University, a lawyer, very good public speaker. I recommend you his lectures, the Snowden, post-Snowden lectures. Exactly. So he really makes that point very clear. It is ecological problem. We have to tackle privacy. He, I think he, he used privacy, but I prefer surveillance as ecological problem. It's really, for, for in, there, are many, uh, there are many parallels. Not only the fact that it, there's always impact on not me, but my community, uh, but also uh, the analogy is even better because like with ecology 20 years ago, people don't want to see the problem. Life is good now, come on. We have the coal, we have the cars, we can develop, we can use the big data engine to speed even more. We don't think of the consequences. And really like with ecology, we might end up in the point where there is no return and we completely, we are doomed to fail. So I think for many reasons, the ecological metaphor works, works very well. Comentarios, preguntas? Vou pra, passar primeiro para o Antum, depois eu passo para você. Deixa eu ver se o fio chega aqui. Então, se você conseguir chegar aqui, vamos lá. First of all, sorry, but my English sucks. <laughs> But I am I mean, trying to do, to make a very sceptic uh, question. We talk a lot about uh, privacy, but we have satellites listening what we are talking here now. We have lots and lots of monitoring and and and, and recording uh, uh, instruments around us all the time. Our cell phone, our computer, our networks are always monitoring. Uh, uh, monitoring, uh, forget the word in English, oh my God. Uh, uh, no, uh, tools, monitoring tools. That's the, the word, <laughs> monitoring tools. Uh, it's not very schizophrenic to talk about privacy, multiplying the monitoring and vigilant uh, tools around us. It's really, uh, uh, it's really uh, a way to uh, take a, take a, take the, uh, take to us some kind of privacy if we live in a, in a such a, uh, in a such uh, um, uh, surveil uh, ambience uh, or environment. Sorry. 
probably I'm an optimist. <laughs> so, uh, um, on my case, I think that many, many people fight with all his heart to fight for the international human rights instruments. And if now technology has become so invasive and we have the luxury to understand how invasive this technology is and how un they undermine democracy, what we should do is to fight to restore democracy in our society. So I won't give up on that. And that's our fight. And we fight in the courts. And we were found in international venues. And we go country by country, spreading the message. So that's, and I have another positive answer. There are things you can do to protect yourself. And so technology could be for the good or for the bad, dual technology. So technology can empower us also to actually protect ourselves against some of this invasive technology. So I suggest you to please visit our website. Uh, la página web es SD dot eff.org which will teach you how to protect yourself against some not all surveillance technology we also ha you are also very lucky that here in rio you have oficina anti vigilancia for an ids who actually do does training on this issue so i encourage you to talk to them after this and try to schedule a, a training <laughs> thank you Aleixo fugiu da pergunta, é isso? Foi embora, Aleixo. Não vai fazer nenhuma pergunta. Vai lá, vai você. Just uh, one remark on Lucas' question about uh, thinking of the relation. We need to remember the work of Frank LaRue. Frank uh, is the special rapporteur on freedom of expression, and uh, he did a great report on surveillance. There were uh, and Katitsa helped and uh, it was presented to the Human Rights Council one week before the Snowden revelations, and it was, well, yeah, before, before, and it was, uh, so, and he's under the, the freedom of expression uh, reporter and mandate, you know, so there is a lot of material from him on this connection, very important one. Aleixo. Segurei o seu lugar na fila. <laughs> so uh, I'm Aleixo from ITS, just like you know. Uh, generally, when we think about surveillance, we think about search engines and social networks and things like that. But in my point of view, try to imagine the, all the data that some credit card companies can gather about you. So I'm a bit suspicious to make this question because just like <laughs> him, I'm a Bitcoin fanatic. Uh, but I, I do think that the role of the cryptocurrencies, especially the ones like Darkcoin and projects like CryptoNote, uh, which aim to make uh, financial transactions untraceable, really important on the, the arena of privacy. But of course, we have problems just like money laundering and things like that. I want to listen from you what should be the right balance so that we can protect the human rights. But not, you know, <laughs> using the bad way technologies like that. So I can, I can try to take that on. So I think this, th the first thing is, this goes back to your question at the very beginning about a marketplace solution, you know, response to some of these issues. If you think about Bitcoin for a second, okay? Five years ago, anybody use Bitcoin? No, okay? Um, three years ago, did people use Bitcoin? Yeah, people use Bitcoin. Was it as well known and, and you know widespread? It's not widespread, but is 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 it much more? It's a thing now. It's like actually a, a means you can actually live off of it, right? Today, right? Well, why? What happened in three four years that changed? Well, you know, one, you know, there's even before Snowden, people were starting to pick up on Bitcoin, but it was a response to what people perceived was. Uh, problems with, you know, the privacy um, protections of the traditional financial instruments in the traditional financing sector. So, so again, the market's not a total solution. It can't be a solution in isolation, but it, but it can provide at least some, you know, progress towards those solutions. Now, in terms of finding a balance, this is a very interesting issue that I think um, we're seeing a lot of um, disagreement and tension over, which is, you know, 
yeah, anonymity is great and privacy is great, but you know we also want to make sure we catch money laundering. So what is the right balance? Well, I think, you know, you know, Kasha, you were talking about you can't accept a Bitcoin uh, donation. Well, to me, that seems like too far on on one side of the spectrum. The idea of a flat prohibition um, or excessive overregulation of the of the field is not going, you know, of the of the currency is not going to work, right? Um, at the same time. Um, obviously, you know, there has to be some policing mechanism and Bitcoin basically relies on, you know, the community of users to police it. And, you know, we'll see how that works. I think it's still kind of early. It still hasn't, you know, completely caught on, but it's, it's definitely growing. But what's important is, you know, you're starting to see at least some countries and some organizations start to at least acknowledge, look, this is not a fad anymore. This is not something that's just going to go away if we ignore it long enough. That this is something we have to address. Um, and the specifics of it, I don't have great answers. I'm sorry. Um, I'm not a financial lawyer, but I think the, the bottom line is if you're thinking about trying to look at these issues optimistically, the fact that it's still here after these last few years and that there are at least some countries and some, like I said, you know, government entities that are willing to at least confront it and deal with it and not by simply saying you can't use it but by saying okay fine we're going to impose some level of regulation on it is a step in the right direction and and it's going to depend on the community of users and for people who you know value an open and free internet and value privacy and anonymity and security they're going to be have to be the ones to develop infrastructure develop uh, regulation d develop proposals, uh, uh, model legislation, to come up with a way to, to strike some sort of balance so that there can be at least a little bit of regulation and safeguard for consumers, but not a complete prohibition or a flat out you know, criminalization of, of using the technology. Um, I want to answer, but in more general terms, not so much on Bitcoin. I think that when we talk about anonymity, it's really, really hard on the internet to be anonymous. Even people who are experts using technology make a mistake at some point in the chain. So, yeah, exactly. So there are processes and there are a judicial system and there are a due process to disclose the identity of anonymous speaker. So what we need to fight to defend anonymity or the way we can frame it is from, with a point of view of the fighting for due process. So you have to if before you disclose the identity of a person, the company has to notify the other person that the data has been sought. If the the, the request can with a gag order, which the company are not allowed to notify someone, what you can do is actually challenge the request, the gag order. That's what Twitter did uh, many years ago when we were the lawyers from this uh, Birgitta Johnstein, John Stein, I cannot pronounce John that, <laughs> who is a congresswoman in the parliament in Iceland. And she was par part of the investigation and the WikiLeaks investigation from the US government. And the US government was requesting data to Twitter about her records on um, their traffic data on, on their Twitter account. And it came with a gag order. So what Twitter did was to challenge the subpoena. And then she, they won. And it was possible for Twitter to notify Birgitta. And Birgitta was able to exercise the right of effective remedy and hire lawyers, in this case EFF, um, uh, ACLU, to represent that and say, hey, your request is too overbroad, it's not proportionate, it's not necessary. We lost in that case. <laughs> but at least that's the due process that we need to fight for. And one of the things that we also say as or we are fighting is to give a timetable for the other party to be able to exercise the right to reply, you know, um, or defend themselves. Because sometimes this happens too quickly, so at least you have to have a little time to prepare yourself and your lawyer, etc. Can I, I want to add one thing about anonymity very quickly, which is, you know, anon the, the hard part about anonymity is the counter argument that you will get, which is, and, and Kasha kind of addresses the beginning, which is if you've got nothing to hide, 
then what's the problem? That's part of it. And the second part of it is the, you know, well, if we give every, if we give you law-abiding person anonymity, we're also giving the child molesters anonymity and the pedophiles anim anonymity, and we don't want that, right? And, you know, you we have to confront that issue head on. And I give you an example about something EFF did, which was in 2012, the state of California passed a law. The voters in the state of California passed a law that said, if you are a registered sex offender, meaning you've committed a crime that involves a sex crime, either rape or molestation, whatever, you have to, as a condition of your reporting requirement to police every year, you have to turn over all of your online usernames. And you have to turn over a list of all the internet service providers that you have an account with, okay? Now, this violates freedom of speech and the right to be anonymous because if the government knows that on Twitter my handle is, you know, blah, 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 okay? My Twitter handle is Hani Fukuri, so it's not going to be very hard for them to find me. But if I don't use, if I use a pseudonym, if I use a different name, okay? But I have to turn over that identifier that discloses who I am. So on its face, this law is unconstitutional. But the problem is it's applied to a group of people that are very unpopular. Okay? So nobody likes sex offenders, right? They've, done, they've committed a crime. They've done something you know, terrible. So, so there's a tension there. And so you know, we, EFF and ACLU said, you know what? This law is, is no good. It starts with sex offenders. It then becomes anyone convicted of a crime. And then it becomes something else. There's, it never ends. It always starts with the most unpopular group because nobody's going to challenge it. And then it, become, it spreads to everyone else. We said, no, we have to stop it right now from the beginning. So the day after the law passed, we sued the state of California. We said this law is unconstitutional. Well, we won. We won in front of the first judge. And then the state appealed it to the Court of Appeals. And like two weeks ago, the Court of Appeals issued a 40-page opinion and said, this law is not only unconstitutional, it's like extremely unconstitutional. It basically said this is a wrong in, it's wrong in this way, it's wrong in this way, it's wrong in this way. And it's a unanimous decision. All three judges agreed. Again, we could have said, well, we're not going to stick up for the sex offenders. We're going to just let them deal with it on themselves and we'll deal with it later. But we didn't do that. And we said, no, we have to stop it now. And we got the court to agree. And it's the same approach we have to take. We can't be scared to be labeled as defenders of pedophiles. We can't be afraid to, to say we defend people who want to harm children. We have to say we defend the Constitution, we defend the rule of law, and it applies to everyone. It doesn't matter what you've done in the past. It doesn't matter, you know, you know we, we believe in the rule of law. Exactly. And so, so I think that's, that is an, a very important issue when it comes to freedom of speech and freedom of expression and anonymity, especially in the Internet world because you're going to start to see the regulation there and we already heard the um, just you know that it's always about the ch on the internet it's always about the child pornography and about the pedophiles and yeah I want to get them off the internet too but you know we n we're not at a way that compromises everyone else's rights too. Uh, yeah, if I can only add to this, I, I thought that it was even some uh, U.S. president who said this. There's a quote, like, if you defend democracy, you end up defending the, 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 the worst ones. Like, you really have to defend everybody in the game, because if you start excluding groups, you just break the standard. That's It's simple as that. Uh, there's Giorgio Agamben, Italian philosopher, analyzing war on terror from that perspective, exactly proving that the moment we excluded terrorists from human rights, we crossed out human rights. It's as simple as that. But I wanted to give another example of this. We were fighting in Poland uh, effectively so far, the internet blocking, exactly on the same premise. Of course, it was introduced or attempt, there was attempt to introduce this just for child porn. And we said, fuck it, of course not. Of course, it will become uh, a leeway, an uh, open door for, for censorship. But how we did that, not only, of course, on the premise of the Constitution, that was the first, but we also were trying to prove that this measure will not help the problem. So maybe that's also a way to go. You. That's important to, to stress that these measures not only break, make a break out from the standard that we have to protect, but also usually they will not get the result. They will not really get the child porn of the internet. They will not really prevent sexual offenders from offending again if they have this problem. So my advice for you always would be to say, to look whether that measure actually brings the result. And usually you will find out that not. And that research is very difficult to undermine. In Poland, we would lo probably lose the game haven't been, uh, if it hadn't been for the case, we were able to prove with some data that this blocking is simply not effective and will never 
prevent the, 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 the child abuse images to, to show up online. Eu vou abrir para mais uma última questão, mas antes, before I, I open for the last question, I'd like to make a, a question myself. So, uh, the question is about the statement that Judge Richard Posner just given about privacy. It's like fresh news. So, Judge Posner is a very respected United States judge. He is very well known for his support of uh, civil liberties sometimes, for instance, gay rights. He was like a, he had like this amazing, wonderful opinion in support of gay rights, and he he's just given a, an opinion completely against privacy. So basically, the headline is: Judge Posner says, "Give NSA unlimited access to digital data," and what he says verbatim was, "I think privacy is actually overvalued." Much of what passes for the name of privacy is really just trying to conceal the disreputable parts of uh, your conduct. Privacy is mainly about uh, to improve your social and business opportunities by concealing the sorts of bad activities that it would cause other people not to want to deal with you. So that's Judge Posner right now. I would love to hear what Danilo and Honey would have to, to, to say about that, because I think that was a very challenging one. I remember Judge Posner has a very famous article called, uh, paradoxically, The Right to Privacy, where he explores the issue in purely economic uh, uh, point of view, in a point of view of his. He, uh, since the beginning of his studies on, he, uh, and, and must I say that Richard Posner is a very brilliant academic and judge. He's a brilliant man. He's a polemist also. So I don't know to which extent he's provoking us or he's really, he really believes on this. I, let's assume he, is re he really believes in what he's, what he's saying. He... What? Hmm? We should bring, bring him here. <laughs> yes, <laughs> impossible to, to, to know for sure. But uh, I believe that since the beginning he posed a question, which is the real question uh, after the, 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 this, provoca uh, this provoking argument from Ronaldo that privacy has an economic value and must be freely exchanged in the market. It poses a very direct question to us that are uh, talking about consent and access to service, free services, free, let's say, services, and the limits that the, the consumers have, the, 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 the access from the, uh, of enterprise to data and of governments to data. In my personal opinion, there are very strict limits when we're talking about privacy as a fundamental right. There are barriers that cannot be crossed uh, and if they are crossed, you gave up some part of your inner indiv individuality and there are barriers that can vary from culture to culture. There are, they, they can vary from, from people from, from one person to another. But if the state, if the law doesn't uh, give us the option to freely choose, if we are really want to give up our privacy in exchange of some value, of some services, of some product, then I believe that the, the law isn't doing its, uh, its part on, the, the, on protecting personal rights. So, so when we're not on video, you can come ask me about my personal opinion about Judge Posner, um, and because uh, I'm not going to say it on video. But uh, I, I disagree with him, um, and I think this is what, what Kasha was saying at the very beginning, that the idea that privacy only serves the value of hiding un you know, bad things about us is just simply wrong, that everybody has something to hide. In fact, hide is maybe the wrong word. Everybody has something that they want to keep to themselves or something they want to only share with a select few number of people. If I meet someone, uh, if I run into someone in the middle of the street, I don't give them my phone number the first minute I, I speak to them. I don't share uh, information about my sexual preferences. I don't share information about my... My social security number, that's like my, you know, identification number with the government. It has all my financial information in it. You know, I keep that information to myself. Um, I don't, you know, and, and that's not a bad thing. It's not because I'm doing something wrong. It's because there's, you know, value to keeping that information private to me. 
um, both because it's sensitive personal information that shouldn't be, that I, I reserve the right to control who gets access to it. It's also because, you know, it's dangerous to turn over some of that information because if I give someone my credit card number, uh, they can take all my money, you know, they can charge up my credit card number. So it's why we don't give each other our bank account numbers. And it's why we don't, it is why Bitcoin exists in the first place, right? So I don't buy that premise at all. Um, I think that, I think that's a very old fashioned way of thinking about uh, privacy. Um, you know, and I think it's unfortunate that a federal judge would say something like that. And I, th and I know where he said that because actually one of our other lawyers is, was at the conference where he said that. And actually, I was invited to go, but I said, I'm in Rio, so I can't go. Um, so I'm glad because I would have probably got mad at Judge Posner, which is not a good thing. Um, but, you know, th that idea is, is an old-fashioned idea that I think is not true, like, as a matter of substantive, is, is not true as a substantive matter. It's not true as a legal matter, even within the United States, where the courts in the United States, he's a U.S. judge. So courts have said in the United States, you have a right of privacy in your phone call. Okay. Well, who has access to your phone call? Well, the phone company that's connecting your phone has, can have access to it. Your phone call can be wiretapped if the government makes a certain showing. So it's not like it's completely private, but we still expect that, you know, no one's going to eavesdrop on my phone call unless certain conditions are met. So it's not true as a matter of law. It's not true as a matter of, you know, social science. They've done research that shows that, you know, people want and value privacy even in an online world. Um, and that just because we have Facebook and Twitter and Google and all these new services that didn't exist 30 years ago doesn't mean that people are willing to say, okay, I give up all my privacy rights in order to use the service. It's, people want both. Um, and so I don't, I don't accept that. And I think, you know, EFF, we, ha we are fighting that. We are fighting that in his courtroom. Um, and we've lost. Uh, but, you know, uh, you know I, I, I think his, that line of thinking is... It's not, you know, he's an older judge. Let's put it this way. He's an older judge. He's been on the bench for a long time. And I think whoever, when he retires, okay, uh, or he passes away and he loses his seat, and the judge that uh, takes his spot is probably going to be someone much younger who's not going to think that way. Um, and so I, I, don't, I don't accept what he says, and, I, and I, I respectfully disagree with him. And like I said, you can come talk to me later about my personal opinion. Well, maybe there's a trick, in, uh, maybe there's a trick in, in, in language, really. Like, if we think of privacy in hiding, that's already sucks. Yeah. Let's talk about controlling what we share, data, things like that, you know? Maybe he just meant the privacy in a different sense, and we discuss it here. We, in my country, I also try to explain that it's really not the right to hide anything and it's not really the private what is key. The key is control data autonomy. Maybe data autonomy is a much better term to express what we, what we talk here about. I can share everything and still have data autonomy because I chose to do so. Very good. I will make a proposal. I think the night is going to go inside. So my proposal is to, that we continue this conversation informally over beer, uh, especially because the wind is getting stronger and stronger and the, the night is running uh, late. So I would like to thank you so much for your fantastic presentations. Please join me in thanking you by clapping our hands. Antes de sair, o ITS queria só oferecer esse livro que a gente publicou, chamado Direito, Tecnologia e Sociedade, uma conversa indisciplinar, no sentido de indisciplina. E tem uma, dois artigos sobre privacidade, um deles do Danilo e o outro do Dave Heller, que o Lucas mencionou. O livro está aqui, quem quiser levar, fica à vontade. <risos>